Welcome. This is uh, part of uh, the Center for Media, Data, and Society's uh, lunch series. And uh, usually we have scholars, but today we have a practitioner. And in uh, keeping with the high standards of CMDS, we have one of the most wonderful practitioners you could possibly meet, Renee Loff. Uh, I met, I don't know, maybe 20 years ago. Uh, when she was, uh, were you editor then? Editor? I was a deputy editor. Deputy editor and then became editor of the editorial page of the Boston Globe. And this made her the highest ranking woman in American newspapers. So she has a <laughs> lot to share with us about, about being a woman in management and about what has happened to American media. We did a provocative title today, The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. Um, not because we're gonna focus on the bad stuff, but because it is a challenging process. And media in America are generally quite different from media in Europe. Um, the traditions, the ethics, the boundaries, the incentives and the disincentives. So that's why I'm very excited that Renee is here. And what she, uh, by the way, I'm Ellen Hume. I think everybody here knows me. Uh, I myself am a journalism practitioner, I was, and I'm writing a book about it. So having Renee here has helped to stimulate my work trying to analyze uh, the legacy of legacy media and where it's going in new digital formats and applications. Um, one of the things that I'm hoping Renee will talk about is what is the secret of success at really one of America's best newspapers. The Boston Globe is, is famous for being <coughs> effective and important. And also I think she'll talk a little bit about what it means to be local as well as national and international because local news has a very special niche, especially in the newspapers, um, even, um, even today in the digital world. So let me talk about who Renee is. She has long covered politics and public policy as a columnist, as well as the edit editorial page editor. She's still a columnist for the Globe. Um, and she's an active thought leader in American politics. Currently, she also edits uh, an architecture magazine in Boston, which Here, I, I have, it. have the wit to bring also. And maybe I'll pass it around. Um, I may, why don't I pass it around if you promise to give it back? It's, it's really a very interesting magazine about um, global warming and architecture and all the issues in Boston um, that have to do with helping the architects be more thoughtful. Um, she was recently a fellow at the Shorenstein Center for the Press, Politics, and Public Policy at Harvard and um, has had the support of traveling journalism fellowships which have meant that she's reported from 14 countries, including Romania and Hungary in 1995. So another thing she's gonna share with us is what, it was, what seems different now, maybe a little bit about that. In 2002, she received a Distinguished Alumni Award from Boston University where she earned her journalism degree and she's been active in women's and uh, press freedom organizations. So Renee, please start with a few comments and then we've agreed we're gonna have a bit of a dialogue and then we're gonna open it up to you guys. So thank you, Renee. Thank you, Ellen. And thank you all for coming on this beautiful afternoon for coming inside. I, I very much appreciate it. Kusunum. <laughs> I, um, as Ellen said, I've been a journalist all my life. I started um, you know, many, many years before most of you were born um, as a, uh, editor of a very small shoestring local community newspaper. It was almost entirely volunteer run. Um, it was called the East Boston Community News and it just covered very local issues of concern in a neighborhood that was rather low income in Boston, one of Boston's many neighborhoods, very ethnic, um, and you know really didn't have very much power vis-a-vis um, -vis the government or vis-a-vis -vis the city hall. And we really helped the community um, bring forward their issues of concern and have a real effect on um, the quality of people's lives. And that experience really hooked me um, into the idea of journalism in the United States as a way to just to improve the lives of ordinary people, to bring forward their concerns and their problems um, and to uh, shine a light on the um, on the needs of people, especially those who didn't have their own very loud voice, people who are not in power, people who are not of influence, and to be the kind of megaphone for those concerns and those voices. Um, I'm fast forwarding you now 20, some 20 years, 
um, I landed at the Boston Globe, which is the largest newspaper in the region of New England in the US. Um, very uh, well-regarded newspaper with a 150-year history, um, pretty much owned by the same family for most of those 150 years. Um, and then in about 1993 became a product of the New York Times Company. The New York Times Company bought the Boston Globe at around the same time that I became the editor of the editorial page. I just want to take a minute to uh, just clarify, many people here may already know, but I'd like to clarify the role of the editorial page as opposed to the rest of the newspaper. And I brought a prop with me. I brought a uh, <laughs> copy of Friday's Boston Globe. Um, most people still do get their news from reading the physical paper, which was interesting. Most people think that um, the digital revolution has changed things entirely, but most people still do get their news. Who read the Boston Globe get it, read it through the newspaper. Um, but of course, the digital applications are growing very rapidly. In any case, this is the Boston Globe, and it has a certain architecture. It has a certain um, uh, format that it, it follows. The most important story is always on the right-hand column of the first page. The second most important story is, well, not so much today, but sometimes the design is a little bit different, but the second story is usually, the most important story usually down here. This is the newspaper. These are the news stories. The um, approach is to um, report the news right down the middle, straight down the middle, no bias, no opinion, just the facts. But here on the back page of the first section, this was my empire. Um, this is the, these are the editorial pages, the opinion pages of the Boston Globe. And here, it's, it's sort of, I'd like to think of it as sort of a chorus of voices. There is here the opinion of the Boston Globe as an institution. So the institutional voice of the Boston Globe. Who do we think you should vote for for president? You know, our endorsements come here. Um, what issues do we think are important? How we like to see a piece of legislation pass or not pass? Um, different legislative issues, all kinds of things here, but it's the voice of the institution of the globe, which is why there's no names associated. These are written by members of the editorial board of the Boston Globe. Individuals write them, but they're not signed because they're supposed to be the opinion, the voice of the entire institution. Here on the opposite page are the op-eds. People think that op-ed means opinion editorial, or sta op stands for opinion, but it actually stands for opposite. Maybe you know this, physically opposite. Of course, all of this architecture is lost now in the digital world because you don't have these clues anymore. But this page is um, for the opinions of individuals who are bylined, they have their names, um, usually full-time columnists, columnists like myself, and all regular uh, opinion columnists like myself, and then members of the community, sometimes prominent members, politicians or bankers or um, leaders of NGOs, um, sometimes just the voice of uh, uh, someone who has an amazing, strong story to tell. And then here's the letters to the editor. That's the voice of the people. That's the voice of the reader. That's the third voice. And we don't pay attention, when I was running the editorial page, I'm sure it's the same now, we don't really pay attention to how they speak to each other. So we're not really concerned if we're going to be in favor of, for example, immigration policy in an editorial. We don't necessarily demand that something on the opposite page has the opposite viewpoint. It doesn't mean that. Um, but sometimes the letters and the editorials and the op-eds are all singing together, you know, um, not necessarily in agreement, but in a kind of chorus or symphony all around the same topics. And if you read the paper regularly enough, every single day for you know, a week or a month, you will start to hear all of those voices um, about the major issues of the day. And that is um, when it's really wonderful. <laughs> and we really can have an effect on public policy. I just wanted to make that clear. And, um, you know, I think I'll just sit down now and, and let uh, Ellen and I have a, a conversation. I'm hoping, I'm really hoping for a dialogue, so very much uh, think about some questions that you might have as we go through our conversation, because I'm as interested in hearing from you as you could possibly be <laughs> in hearing from me. Thank you. Thank you, Renee. Um, one of the things that uh, was lost, I think, with the new digital transfer 
is this notion of objectivity. It's considered to be evil. It's considered to have been a stupid waste of time and a fake, not really real. Nobody really tried to be objective. Nobody tried to carry the narrow referee's role. And newspapers like The Globe were objective or still are or try to be in some ways, meaning that they don't take in the news pages a particular huge political campaign. If they do that, that's considered unethical and improper professionally. That's different from most uh, European papers in my experience and also from US papers back in the early 19th century. But the objectivity idea for me was that it protected the journalists from their own publishers and from their own advertisers. Because if we were supposed to be objective, that meant that our own publisher wasn't supposed to dictate to us what the story was supposed to be. We were supposed to find it in the community. It also meant that if Ford Motor Company, our big advertiser, wanted us to do a story about his Ford cars, we could say, well, if it's objective, there might be some negative stuff in there. Do you really want that? <clears throat> so what, what did you find in your work um, about objectivity? Because you were the editorial page, and you weren't supposed to be objective. Right. But how did you influence the news page? Here you are, the voice of the newspaper saying, vote for Joe. What if the news page is at the same time saying, Joe's a crook? How, how did that work, actually? Well, you know, I also was, I've been 25 years at the Boston Globe, and so I was also a reporter on the objective news side, as well as being the political editor. I was the first woman political editor at the Boston Globe. And just for the record, I was the highest ranking woman at the Boston Globe, not in all of journalism. Oh, well. <laughs> so I <laughs> probably, I mean, you know, the Boston Globe is all of journalism, I suppose. But, but you uh, were way, there were not many newspapers. There were not at many women level. at that high level. That's women. very true. That's very right. True. Thank you. Um, there was a woman editor at the New York Times, so she probably had a tick higher uh, <laughs> status um, than I. Um, uh, so what was I saying? So I have, I have experience both in the news side and in, in the uh, opinion side, which is very instructive. I mean, I think to, to really do the opinion job properly, you have to have had that foundation in straight news, so-called straight news reporting. Um, because otherwise uh, you don't have quite the respect for both sides of the story, which even in the opinion pages, even when we had very strong views on a piece of legislation or a candidate for office, it was very important to me always to recognize and hear the other side's view. Um, because otherwise um, it came out too much like propaganda instead of as a considered uh, evaluation of all of the facts and um, viewpoints and then we would distill all that and apply it to our values and come up with an opinion on a piece of legislation or a candidacy. Um, just to you know say oh we think we like this candidate I think that comes through I think the reader can tell that this is a shallow um, assessment of a, uh, a candidacy or a, uh, an issue so it's very important to um, have that uh, that backing of uh, respect for both sides of the story, which we very much learn in, in our journalism practice um, in order to make uh, an, you know really efficient editorial. We didn't really uh, try to or feel it was our role in any way to influence the news side. Um, there really was a, we used to call it a Chinese wall or a separation of church and state between the news side <laughs> and the opinion side. I know that not all the readers and, and you know, uh, public officials and so on really believed that. Um, when I was political editor, it was during a big campaign for the mayor of Boston, first new mayor that we'd had in, in 10 years. And I had, you know, 11 reporters uh, uh, out there on the political team. And we had a big uh, campaign coverage of eight different candidates for mayor. And almost every day I would get a phone call from somebody um, representing one of these eight candidates or the candidate themselves saying, you know, uh, you're not being fair, you're not giving me enough ink, you're not, you're paying more attention to the other candidates, you know, uh, and this is because your paper is going to endorse this fellow or has endorsed this fellow. Actually made my job very difficult on the news side once the newspaper took a position and endorsed um, a candidate for, for mayor. Um, but I just had to keep saying, you know, you don't, may not think so, but really, we were in different parts of the building. We really did not speak to each other. We had no communication ahead of time. 
I know from having been on the editorial page that the decision whom to endorse for a political office is a huge secret. And we would have special kind of cloak and dagger um, uh, methods to make sure that it would never leak out who we were going to be endorsing. We would you know, not write it until the very last minute. It was kind of you know, ridiculous. But we really tried to keep a separation between the news and the opinion pages. To move to how does a story become a story in a paper like the Boston Globe, which is one of the most respected regional papers in the United States. Um, I was interested in going through the, 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 one of the most important series that the Globe ever did, which was leading the expose of sex abuse in the Catholic Church. This was a huge moment in a very Catholic community. Our readers, your readers are Catholic, uh, largely. Um, many of them have been abused. What, what caused you guys to do the story? What took you so long? Mm. And what impact did it have when the Globe did take the, this, the story? How did yeah. it start and, and what happened? In 2003, the Boston Globe won the Public Service Award from the Pulitzer Committee, the Pulitzer Prize, the highest honor that a newspaper, American newspaper, can win. And the Public Service Award is kind of like best, best picture. You know, it's sort of the number one top. Among all of the awards, it's the number one award um, for its coverage of the sex abuse Pulitzer scandal. Pulitzer was a Hungarian, by the way. I think I knew that, yeah. yes. Yeah. Um, and um, so, uh, the, the story was a year in preparation. There was a team of five full-time reporters on a so-called spotlight team um, investigating this story. And interestingly, sometime this fall, I think in September, there's going to be a, actually a film, a movie, um, that's been produced about this story that maybe some of you will have a chance to see, where Michael Keaton is playing Walter Robinson, the uh, editor of the chief of the Spotlight team, and Mark Ruffalo is playing one of the reporters, and um, it's going to be a kind of a Hollywood, we'll see how accurate it is, but there's going to be a... a uh, you know, major motion picture. An update of all the president's men, perhaps. Something like that, because it is such a, a compelling story. Yeah. Um, you know, I was on the editorial page, so I didn't sit in on those news meetings um, where this story first uh, came to light. But I, I can say that, that, and I know that we had a new editor. Um, his name was Marty Barron. He was not from Boston. He was from the, he had been at the LA Times and the Miami Herald, and he was not so he was not steeped in Boston's culture or its politics or its power relationships. And one morning, they were they're having their regular morning meeting. There's two meetings a day in the newsroom, one in the morning about 10.30 and one in the afternoon around 3.30 to discuss you know, what stories will be in the next day's paper. And the different editors, sub-editors, go around and say, well, we have something in the courts today. We have something at the state house. We have something in the police department people who representing different beats um, explaining what's in the news that day. And the fellow who had the court's beat said, you know, well, there's a, there's a case that's coming up and it might be interesting. It's a charge of, you know, sex abu sexual abuse against a priest by somebody who was a young, you know, a minor at the time and he's bringing a, um, uh, a you know, a charge against the, the priest, you know, but, um, you know, the, all the records are closed and we can't really do very much. We can just report on the fact that it's happening, but everything is sealed and we won't be able to really tell very much of the story. And the editor, in a way not knowing any better, just said, wait a minute, why are the records sealed? And, oh, well, privacy concerns, of course, you know, the records would be sealed. And he said, well, you know, this, this fellow, Marty Barron, is a real newsman. You know, it's sort of like, here's the story, here's an obstacle, <laughs> he's going to get to that story, you know, and he's going to knock over the obstacle on his way. And this is just what he said. We he's said, now well, the editor of the Washington Post. He's right? now the editor of the Washington Post. And he said, well, let's try to get the records unsealed. You know, it was sort of, why, oh, we never had thought of that before, because there had been previous uh, claims of sex abuse against priests in Boston for at least 20 years. and. There was always a sense, oh, you didn't want to go there, you didn't want to dig in too much, you know, it, the records were sealed and there were a lot of privacy concerns and, um, you know, no, I don't think, in fact, I'm quite sure that there was never a direct uh, threat or request of the Boston Globe not to cover 
these kinds of stories, but they were just difficult and and unpleasant. Well, you and were worried about your audience being Catholic and to not some extent we were it. worried about the audience because yeah. the Boston Globe had a reputation of being very liberal politically. Um, and now here's where the the news side and the opinion side in the minds of the readers start to blend. Even though we really did keep a strong separation, um, the Boston Globe has a reputation of being quite uh, liberal. So we are in favor of abortion rights, for example, which many Catholics are not, or at least the Catholic Church is not. Um, we were in favor of, um, I'm trying to think of what else with Catholics. Yeah. Oh, we were very much in favor of school busing, the integration of the public schools in Boston in the 1970s, which was a very, um, difficult time for Boston, a lot of violence, a lot of prejudice exposed. Um, the Boston Globe was very strong in favor of the integration of the Boston public schools. And many of the white, ethnic, Irish, Catholic families who opposed school busing, not only because they didn't want you know, young black children coming into school with them, but they didn't want their children bused halfway across the town to go to a strange school in a strange neighborhood. So the, the opposition to busing you know, was more complicated than just pure racism. But in any case, the Boston Globe was very much in favor of busing, and there was a hangover from that even 30 years later, um, whereby there was a concern that the Boston Globe was seen as anti-Catholic. Um, and so, yes, that was part of the um, concern to go forward with this case. But Marty Barron says, let's go after this, these records. We got a lawyer, we went to court, and lo and behold, a judge said, yes, I think there's a compelling interest here in the, of the, on the public's part to see the full story. And so we were able to get all kinds of correspondence from priests who were being reassigned away from the parishes where they had been accused of having inappropriate, you know, sex abuse or whatever you want to call it, um, uh, claims against them uh, transferred to other parishes where, you know, sort of put that story under the rug. We had all of the documents. We had actual letters with the signature of the, the cardinal. Um, saying, you know, I'm, I'm sending this person away, you know, don't make any noise here. And the Globe published not only the stories with testimony from victims who were named and who were willing to come forward and, and tell their stories, um, denials from the church, but we also had the physical evidence, the handwritten letters, and just things that were not, uh, they were undeniable. Um, we ran a series of stories, you know, in a row, like five stories in a row. This is after a year of investigation, though, I should say, you know, where the Boston Globe, and this is what I fear it will be lost in this new age of digital journalism and in this new economic reality of uh, not enough real resources in, in traditional journalism. The Globe could invest in five full-time writers, reporters, writing for an entire, working for an entire year without a single word be writ being written. And we also had all five of the reporters on the Spotlight team, so happened, were Catholic. So there was, there was that, you know, there was a, a sense. That was important, why was that important? Very important to show that the, that, as we said earlier, that this was not coming out of anti-Catholic bias on the part of the Boston Globe, that these reporters themselves were Catholics and were practicing Catholics, and, and several of them actually practicing, you know, quite religious um, Catholics, but who just thought this, this um, behavior on the part of the priest was, you know, inexcusable. So my point being, a, a big investigation, a lot of investment on the part of the Boston Globe before a single word was written. Um, after that first series of stories came out, the floodgates opened. People were calling, um, you know, other victims, uh, mothers and sisters of victims. Um, it was just quite remarkable. And much to our surprise, really, and relief, the people of Boston, especially Catholics, were 100% behind the story. Um, of course they wanted the story out. You know, of course they wanted to have um, these priests who are responsible for this abuse to be held accountable. And so that's basically the... And what was the, the impact, the policy impact, the legal impact of all these stories coming out of the paper of record 
in Boston? Well, there, there were a number of, of uh, um, legal cases. Um, there was one priest who actually did go to jail. Um, but part of the problem was that there is a statute of limitations. Um, you cannot bring a charge against um, a you know, suspect, a perpetrator, uh, after a certain number of years. And now I'm just blanking on what the number of years 20, is, 20 it? years or something. Um, you know, you're just not allowed to bring a claim so many years later. Um, and so a number of these cases fell under the statute of limitations and you were not able to, the victims were not able to seek redress in the courts because the thing had happened 20, 25 years ago. Um, one of the things that the editorial page, you know, when I was running the editorial page, um, called for was a change in that law in Massachusetts when it comes to issues of sexual abuse, not necessarily in guard, uh, involving priests, but in any kind of sexual abuse case involving a minor, because we felt that the you know you needed the minors may need time to become you know full adults before they decide they want to bring a, a charge of something that happened to them when they were children, um, and indeed we were able to get that law changed. Um, the you know legislature wasn't only because of the Boston Globe, but we really uh, you know repeatedly called for that in the pages of the editorial page of the Boston Globe and did get that law changed. So now there is no um, statute of limitation at all in Massachusetts for um, a crime of sexual abuse involving minors. And wasn't the Globe the first real uh, effort to expose this problem that the Catholic Church yes. has been having internationally? for yes. decades, for generations. So yes. it was really the opening of a whole issue that had been suppressed. And, and that's, that's something that it took concerted reporting for a full year. It took victims being willing to step up and use their names. And it took um, an editor who came from out of town, so he didn't really see the sacred cow that the Catholic Church was in Boston. But you can't touch that. Um, I also think it took a... Um, even though there was some suspicion of the Boston Globe's politics among the Irish Catholic readership, it took an institution with 150 years of um, credibility that had been you know, slowly and painstakingly building with the community, a newspaper that comes out every day that, you know, that, that holds itself up to correction when it gets something wrong, that you know, uh, is responsible for its own words for 150 years. I think that was a very big part of it too. It wasn't just the voice of five reporters or the voice of one or 10 or 20 victims. It was, it was coming from an institution that had built up its credibility in the community over many, many years. And this is something else that I think um, is in jeopardy in the new um, world. You know, I mean, a, a blogger in, in his pajamas is not going to necessarily be able to sue the Catholic Church, sue for um, these documents to be opened, or to have that credibility that the Boston Globe, the institution, does have. So could this has. story uh, have been exposed in today's world, do you think? Yes, I think it's possible. I think there are, there are other models um, that we are starting to experiment with. It's not just in the United States, but everywhere in this new, uh, brave new world of um, uh, collapse of uh, the traditional economic model that supports a newspaper like the Globe. There are other models that we're looking at, nonprofits, our um, you know, grant-making kind of um, support for investigative journalism. Is starting to, um, you know, is starting to bubble up, but it's not really a mature um, response yet. And you know, I often feel like that legacy media or journalism, as I know and love it, is is sick. It has it has an, a disease. It has an illness, which is it's lost its economic uh, model. And I often feel like there's a race to find the cure. You know, there's a race to find a new model, a new way of supporting the journalism. Because journalism, good journalism, is expensive. You know, it's expensive to sue the Pentagon or to sue um, the Catholic Church. And we're, we're sort of in a race to find this, this new, you know, drug or a cure for the economic woes of this industry. And in the meantime, 
a lot of people are dying. You know, a lot of little newspapers are dying. A lot of journalists are being laid off. A lot of um, great stories are not being written. And I do believe, because I'm an optimist, that we will find the cure to journalism's economic ills. But I do worry about what will get lost before we get there. Great. I mean, not great, but thanks for that. <laughs> uh, before we turn to you guys, and if you have any questions or comments, I want to just touch one more subject area, which is the woman thing. Mm. Um, here you are. Uh, you're not even very tall, no. right? And you're supposed to be this leader of the editorial page, and normally in all, uh, a male uh, place, I mean, for generations. What, what happened there? What were some of the good, bad, and ugly things about that? Mm. I was often the only woman in the room. I mean, th this is something that I became comfortable or familiar with from the very beginning of my career in journalism. I, even the little um, community papers I worked for, or weekly, um, I worked for before getting to the Globe, I was always the only woman on the news side, or the only woman in the room when we would at the editorial page when we would have, you know, state officials in, you know, heads of state would come into the globe to try to get us to support their position, whatever it might be. I was always the only woman in the room. Um, and after a while, you, start, you stop seeing it, or at least I stopped seeing it. I mean, I wasn't always hyper vigilant or hyper conscious of being the only woman in the room, but it was often the, the truth. Um, you know, it is a male dominated profession. Um, very much like politics is in the United States still, um, even though women have made gains. I, I looked up some statistics and I learned that in the past 20 years, there has been almost no movement in the percentage of women in American newsrooms. It's 39%. And it was like 39.3% and now it's 39.5%. I mean, it's very, um, there has been very small growth. And of course, as you know, as newspapers are losing jobs, if something like 16,000 jobs were lost in journalism in, the dec in this past decade, um, it is often the last hired, which is usually women, um, and also to the, some extent minorities, who are the first fired. Um, and so there's, there has been no real growth in the number of women. I will say, though, that, that the presence of women in American newsrooms has had an influence, you know, out of proportion to their numbers. Um, and a number of, uh, in the you know, 35 years I've been in this profession, a number of issues I've seen um, become front and center in the sort of community dialogue that would not have happened had there not been women in the newsrooms. I think particularly about domestic violence, um, you know, spouse abuse, we used to call it. Um, that is an issue that for years, very much like the Catholic Church abuse scandal, for years it was hidden, um, you know, abusive spouses were understood to just be, you know, letting off steam or something. The police would come if somebody had called or a neighbor had called and heard shouting or screaming. Police would come and say, oh, this is a domestic dispute, you know, just settle it among yourselves. Um, and it took women reporters, I mean, I, I wouldn't say that there was any one individual heroine in this regard, but just women generally. Um, to go to those news meetings and say, hey, there's a story here, you know, that we have some numbers we can, we can get because it's public record, we can get the um, police calls, and you will see that there are, you know, there have been hundreds of police calls, and we never report on that why, and, you know, there were advocates, of course, for women's rights who we could interview, there were victims we could interview, and I think that, that domestic violence became an issue of concern um, exactly because women were um, present at those meetings in the newsrooms. I can say also that when we were covering presidential campaigns in, mm. the, in the 70s and 80s, uh, the 80s really, uh, this was the first time that a candidate's hypocrisy about uh, his family could be really covered, and it's because I think, because women started to be in the press bus covering these candidates as one day their wife would be with them, um, you know, showing off the family, and then the next day there'd be some Hollywood starlet on the plane with us, and we'd say, why, who is this woman? Oh, well, you know, she's my friend, okay. The wife is off, the starlet is in, but before, nobody would comment on that. That's right.